We're still working on some kinks. Welcome, everybody. I think we're already live streaming. Sound like we are? Yeah. Welcome, everybody, to the live stream. We're still working on some kinks. We're trying to get where we can do the five-minute countdown and, and not send our microphones through the, through the web or live stream. But that's okay. We're not saying nothing you can't hear. We just, sometimes we have instructions. Sometimes we have announcements that's uh, specific to the church. And so we're just working on getting those things done. How's everybody doing today? Y'all welcome the people on live stream. All right. So to ti the, the title of tonight is I'll tell you in a moment. Now the title tonight is The Big Picture. The Big Picture. And I want us to, we're going to be probably in the book of Romans. But it's Romans, the big picture. And you know, we've mentioned before that there's three people groups on the earth. Uh, there's the sinners, and that encompasses all who are outside of Christ. There are the believers, and that encompasses all who are in Christ. And then there are the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and that encompasses everybody that's in the Jewish nation. Well... The book of Romans addressed these three people groups. And we have to understand, when we talk about the gospel, the gospel is more than salvation. Paul said this in uh, Galatians chapter 1. He said, someone has come and they've preached another gospel to you. And it was a gospel of trying to be mature or perfect by works. Now we know that that was a Pharisaic, um, the, he, he called them the sect of the circumcision and all those things. But we see the same thing happen today that uh, people are trying to say there's, a, there's a, a way you can be saved apart from repentance, apart from Christ. And so I want to talk to you about the big picture of Romans and talk to you about the, the full gospel, the full gospel, okay? Now, a lot of times when we say full gospel, we get different uh, images in our mind, but I really want to talk to you about the full gospel, the big picture. So the gospel to the sinner is this, that a sinner can be freed from the penalty of sin. A sinner can be freed from the penalty of sin. There is a penalty of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. It says in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is determined against uh, the ungodliness, ungodliness of men and unrighteousness of men. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And in that same chapter, verse 16, Paul declares this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also, also to the Greek or the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. And so we see, we understand that the, the beginning church was made up of Jewish people. And then when... Uh, Peter went to Cornelius' household. It was opened up to the Gentile nations. Remember Jesus told Peter, he said, I'm going to give you some keys. and You're going to open up some doors. And that's what Peter did. He opened the doors to the Gentiles. And so it says that the wrath of God is already in the earth against ungodliness, unrighteousness, sin. And so the gospel to the sinner, the good news of the gospel is that you can be freed from the penalty of sin. You can be freed from the penalty of sin by simply believing on Christ and placing faith in the atoning blood for the forgiving of sin. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? And it is. You can be freed from the penalty of sin by believing on Jesus Christ and placing faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ for the washing away of your sins, for the forgiving of sins, okay? Now, there is, there's different speculations, different mindsets. I'll tell you my mindset. I believe that we are freed from the penalty of sin 
but I don't believe that we're always freed from the uh, consequences of sin. Sin still has a consequence. It's just, I mean, it's just, you just look and it is. I mean, sin has a consequence. But we are saved from the penalty of sin. And it says we are saved by the pen, from the penalty of sin because we believe on Jesus Christ. Remember, He came to seek those who are lost, those who need salvation. And this place is the sinner. When the sinner believes on Jesus Christ, receives the forgiveness of Jesus' atoning blood, when he does that, the moment he does that, he is placed into the very family of God. His very identity changes. It is that quick. The moment I believe is the moment I was transferred into another kingdom, into another family. I became a new creation. Right? And we have to keep that in my mind, keep that in our mind. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you write that down, it says that anyone is who, is who is in Christ, whosoever is in Christ Jesus, if any man is in Christ, the King James says, he is a new creation, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Now we're going to talk about that new thing in just a moment, but I want to finish up here, and I want you to know that the, sal the salvation message to the sinner is good news. There is no other good news for a sinner on the earth but the blood of Jesus Christ. There is salvation, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, I think it is. Salvation is in no other name except the name of Jesus. There's no other name given in earth or uh, in earth whereby men must be saved. Jesus himself said that no one can come to the Father except by him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so it's, it's his blood is the only thing that can atone for my sin. So the moment I receive forgiveness of my sin, there is a new heart that the Holy Spirit places in me. That's the baptism that 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, is it uh, 13, 18, somewhere in there? We're baptized into one body. Those of us who believe, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into one body. That's the baptism that the Spirit baptizes us with when we believe on Jesus Christ. A lot of times we get so confused and mixed up and, and crosswise on all our terminology. What scripture? Verse 13. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, uh, we have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And so the Spirit of God places us into the body. The moment I receive forgiveness of my sin, I become a new creation. A new heart is placed within me. And in that heart is written upon that heart the laws of God. And so I please God because I follow that now. Okay, And so it says this, it imparts, 1 Peter says that it imparts the divine nature, or 2 Peter, that the divine nature, we can be partakers of the divine nature. So when we get saved, that what goes in us is the divine nature. It's the nature of Christ, the nature of the Spirit of God, the nature of God. Okay? And He separates us from the wrath of God against sin. As we read in first, I mean Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is already in the earth against all sin. Notice it doesn't say sin of sinners and not the sin of saints. It says all sin, all ungodliness of men. It didn't say lost men. The wrath of God is in the earth. But the way we can be freed from that is to receive forgiveness of, of Christ and be atoned by the blood of Jesus, right? And then he, he saves us from the penalty of that sin, right? And so the wrath of God is in the earth, but we can be saved from that if we will follow the big picture, okay? So the big picture for the sinner is you don't have to be a sinner any longer. You don't have to, you don't have, to have the, the wrath of God upon you any longer. You can receive Jesus Christ. And so, as I said earlier, and I may have said that wrong, but the, the consequences of sin are still in the earth. There is still life and death set before us. There is still blessing and cursing set before us. And we must choose. But if we learn to choose and walk in this new life, then we'll see a power of God available to us that we haven't had before. Right? And so it separates us from the wrath of God against sin. Now, man, on his own has no remedy for sin. You understand that, right? 
no matter how much you try, no matter how much you cry, you have no remedy of sin apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? Now, man on his own has no remedy for sin that resides on the inside of him. It resides in us. The Bible says in Romans uh, 5, I think it is, it was by one man's sin that sin came into the earth. Talking about Adam. And it says that sin passed on to every human being. But one man's righteousness, which is talking about Christ Jesus, righteousness came into the earth. And salvation from that sin. Right? And so every one of us has sin on the inside of us. Right? And we have to be saved from that sin. But ultimately, if I don't do anything, the only, I won't have a remedy for it myself. But what I will do is I will ultimately resort to one or two actions. If I do not accept what, Jesus, or what God's remedy for sin is, I will resort to two actions, one of two actions myself, to try to atone for that or to uh, take care of that sin. Because a sinner knows he's a sinner. It says in verse 1, or verse 1, number 1 that I got here. Number 1, he will try to appease his conscience with works. And that's why Paul told the Galatians, he says, How are you so soon removed from the gospel of grace, the gospel of faith? He said, Did you receive this by the works of the law or by faith? He said, And if you received it by faith, then how are you going to be perfected by works? Now, he's talking to born-again people. But an unborn-again person will always try to appease his conscience with works. Well, I'm a good person. That's what you'll hear from a sinner. Well, I'm a good person. I didn't say you weren't a good person. Or you're a saved person. There's a difference between being a good person and a saved person. Okay, we're talking about two different things. But this will always lead to idolatry. Because we think that we can appease or atone for our own sin. It's a works-based thing. Christianity is the only religion that has a method, mode, or way to remove your sin or to forgive your sins for forgiveness, okay? And so some people will turn to asceticism. Some people, and that means to deny yourself, to be strict on your whole body, to... To, you'll see, they go up and climb a pole and sit for months. Ascetics. No food. They go to monasteries and all this stuff. That will not atone for sin. Even religious acts of service. The rosary beads, that's not limited to the Catholic Church. That's in Muslim religion. That's in other religions, Hindu religions. And so the rosary beads, the, the, we... You know, in the Catholic Church, they say Hail Marys or whatever. But in other religions, they do other things. One religion says if you kill some infidels, then you have a sure way to heaven. Our religion says if we die to ourselves, we have a sure way to heaven. Jesus Christ. Amen? And so this will always lead to idolatry. Because we are looking to ourselves or within our own selves to cure a problem that can only be cured. It's an incurable problem for the human race. It can only be cured in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? Number two, if he, if he doesn't try to appease his own conscience of a sin and the guilt of sin, he will deny the reality of sin and will embrace the sin and reject all forms of religion. What's the word for that? Atheist. Humanism. We are God the higher power within us. There is no higher power within you if you're not born again. So to the sinner, the gospel of salvation, the big picture is pointed out between Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 5. It tells a sinner how a sinner can be saved. And it always shows. It shows that if we reject that, the, the circumstances or the results of that number 2 is what we see in Romans 1. God gives them over to a reprobate mind. He gives them over to a reprobate mind. Uh, Thessalonians, is it? Uh, 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians says that if you have no love for the truth, then God will give you over to a lie. Strong delusions, the Bible says. And so we must love the truth. 
Jesus even says this in Revelation. He says we must buy the truth. Buy it and hold on to it. I think David even says that in the, in the psalm. We must buy truth and hold it. The truth is what sets us apart. The truth is what frees us. And so if, if, we, if we reject all forms of... If we reject sin altogether, we will reject all forms of religion. And we will see the wrath of God come because God will give us over to a reprobate mind. And that's what we see. We're seeing that happen today very, in our very, before our very eyes. Okay, So Romans chapter 1 through 5 is the gospel for the sinner. Now, I'm very particular or very cautious about saying this because some people say I'm trying to say there's two gospels. No, the gospel of Jesus Christ covers two aspects of Christian or two aspects of human beings or human life: the sinner and the saint. Okay, the person who is born again doesn't need to have uh, the gospel of salvation preached to them all the time. Yes, we need to remind ourselves of it. Paul says we stand in it. We remind ourselves of it and we think about it. We, we love it. We embrace it. But the message of salvation to the sinner is the cross of Jesus Christ. But there is also a gospel within the gospel of Jesus Christ for the believer. If, if it's not, then all we have is forgiveness. But we understand that Jesus made some statements in, in, his, uh, in his great sermon on the mount. He says, if you're hungry and you're thirsty... You'll be filled. He told him in John chapter 7, he said, If you'll believe on me, as the scripture says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Not only will you be fed, but you'll feed others. And see, that's God's true design for our lives. It's not about whether I can get me a car or not. It's not whether I can get me health or not. It's whether I can serve you and get you to the place where you need to be. I was saying when we were praying earlier today, <clears throat> I kept seeing, and this, this thought, and I, I mentioned it in my prayer at the end, but we don't win unless we all cross the line at the same time. We don't. Because this is not an individual race. Yes, there are rewards for our lives in heaven, but our goal is to help everyone cross the finish line. And so the, the image I saw was uh, the, what's that, the, the leg race, the, when you three the three-legged race. You know, back in, you know, back in the day, they'd have uh, parties and things, and they'd tie somebody's legs together, and they had to run together. And if they couldn't get it, get the rhythm of it, then they, they wouldn't do very well. And I think that's, that's a very powerful picture for the church today. If we can't learn to run together, then we're not going to run separately. We're not going to make it. And so I think about what Jesus said. Je Jesus said this. He said, he said, now Jesus said this. He said, Father, I sanctify myself. Why? For them. In other words, he said, I'm setting myself apart for your plan, to your plan, for them. And then he prays that we be sanctified by the truth. So guess what I need to do? Lord, I sanctify myself as a pastor, I saint myself, sanctify myself for you guys. Or I should. And so the born-again uh, gospel that we see from the gospel of Jesus Christ is Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Six through eight chapters. Chapter 6 through 8. And we'll look at them in a minute. Now many, remember, we, go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17. So now you got, you've got it noted that the gospel to the sinner is, the good news to the sinner is that you are saved from the wrath of God or, or from the penalty of sin, right? The good news to the believer is that you can be saved from the power of sin. That's what we have to understand. And there will be a moment when, true, when our full salvation is here, we'll be saved even from the presence of sin. But right now, we see in the church too many people that are 
alive in Christ, but they're bound like Lazarus. And until someone sets them free, they will not be able to walk around freely. Jesus commanded life to take place, and life took place. But it says Lazarus was bound from head to toe. And I believe we see that in the church today. We see many believers who truly believe in God, who have truly been born again, who were bound by different things in life, whether it's traditions, whether it's uh, uh, thought life or whatever. They're bound by that. They need to be set free. Jesus didn't, he didn't command the raps to come on. He told them, he said, you loose him. And so we have a part to play in the salvation of others and the victory of others. This is a team sport that we're in. That's why Romans 12 says, and not Romans 12, Hebrews 12 says, that we have a great cloud of witness following us. They're watching us. And we're all running this race. See, the problem is, is we've taken the gospel and we made it personal. It is personal, but it's, it's, we're an assembly. Jesus didn't say, I would build the individual and the gates of hell will not stand against that individual. He said, I'll build the church. I'll build the called out ones. I'll build the ecclesia or the ecclesia, depending on what hemisphere you're from. But I will call, I will build this church, this entity, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, now we're built up in that. Of course it's for me. I take the word of God, I, I use it for myself, but I pray, we have to get to the place where we pray for others as, as badly as we want it, we want it for others. Okay? Let me move on. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 5, did you go, you write that down? So it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. It says, behold, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your struggle with sin has become new. The sinner has no power over sin at all. They think they do. They think it's their choice. They have no choice. The Bible says you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to it. But when you get born again, the penalty of that sin is removed and a power to overcome that sin has come. The thing about it is, I look at my life, and I'm by no means perfect, but I look at my life and I compare it with years ago. Every day of my life, sin still comes and knocks on the door. The, the thing is now, the majority of the time, I let Jesus answer the door. I'm not without sin. The Bible says if I say that, I'm making God a liar. He's not a liar. But the same thing that says that says if I walk in the light as He is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. Okay? And so now, old things have passed away. So now I don't, I don't have to. Let me, let me make that. I don't have to struggle with sin. If I will educate myself with what's happened inside myself. And then I don't have to condemn others, I teach others. You think about prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14. And I know it thinks that you think I'm scattering, but I'm not. 1 Corinthians 14 says that prophecy is for, not for us, but it's for the church. Edification exhortation and comfort. To prophesy over someone is to give them edification, to build them up. And you have the life of Christ dwelling in you. Did you know that you are an overcomer, Sadie Miller? You are an overcomer and the enemy has no hold on you. That's edification. Exhortation. Sadie, I exhort you to grab hold of God. And don't let go. Get in the Word. And she does that. Get in the Word and never, never let it go. That's an exhortation. I'll just keep using Sadie. Sadie, I know your struggles have been real, but I want to let you know that the power of God resides on... That's a word of comfort. 
See, we want it all so spooky. But it's, that right there is prophecy. I can't, I can't tell you all that yet. So anyway, it says, old things have passed away. So my struggle with sin has passed away. The way I deal with sin has passed away unless I keep reviving it. Okay? So let's look at chapter 6 now because we're talking about the born-again believer. So Paul says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The apostle of grace says, God forbid. How shall we live any longer therein? Considering our new identity. Considering my new identity. I have a new identity, remember? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm a new man in Christ. Old things passed away. So now I need to be educated. I need to be relevated. Is that the right word? I need the Spirit of God to give me revelation. Not only what's in the Word, but what's in me. And then I need to teach others what's in them. And that's why Jesus, when He, when he ascended on high, He gave gifts unto the church. Notice why He gave those gifts. We won't turn there, but you know in Ephesians 4, He gave those gifts for the maturing of the saints, for the perfecting of the saints. Not so they could live nice and like fat cats, but for the perfecting of the saints. Hmm. And so he says this, God forbid, how shall we that are dead in sin live any longer therein? So as I said, sin is coming to knock every day. It does. The enemy is like the terminator. It's all he does. Temptation, accusation, and frustration. Temptation, accusation, and deception. That's his, that's his power. Is it, is, it, um, is it in Corinthians that says he's not able to tempt us above what we're able, or God would not allow us to tempt us above what we're able to bear? It doesn't say that God won't put more on you than you can bear. It says that God will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. But he says this, that he cannot attempt you with what's more than common to man. Accusation, temptation, and deception. That's all he's got. So if you know the truth, you're a third of the way there. Right? If you know who you are in Christ, it doesn't matter what he says about the... Uh, what was the second thing to say? I can't remember those things. Accusation. If you know who you are, the accusation doesn't matter. And if you understand the power that resides on the inside of you, then you are above the temptation. So it says this, Romans 6, 1, how can we live any longer in this thing when we have a new identity? Now, let me say this. Romans chapter 7, the struggle was real. Everybody, oh, was Paul talking about himself? It don't matter. The struggle is real. You have a new heart. You have a new identity. But you have the same old enemy with the same old tricks. And every day he's coming with the same old mess. And you're going to struggle because in your mind you want to serve God. You love God. You want to follow God. But in your flesh you find out that you slip back to the old ways of life. He's an ancient adversary, y'all. But, once we come to Romans 8, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Paul says, I thank my God that through Christ Jesus. So Romans 7 is, the struggle is real. Romans 6 is, we should not live in sin. Romans 7 is the struggle is real, but Romans 8 is the answer. Because the one, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So I will serve him by walking in the spirit of God. 
So that tells me that those, the sinner is on that side of the cross, needs to come to the cross. But then once we're on this side of the cross, you understand, this side of the cross is salvation. There's another destination. It's the upper room. Jesus told His disciples, He said, You were clean now by the word I've spoken of you. He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then He said, Don't leave till you get endued with power from on high. Too many Christians are living on this side of the cross, but they haven't gone to Pentecost. Because in our minds, we've got it all mixed up of what it is. We've made the Holy Spirit something instead of someone. We've made Him His gifts instead of His gift that comes with Him. He's not His gifts. They come with Him. He is God. He is part of the Godhead. He is a, a member of the Godhead that indwells the believer, that brings us overcoming victorious power. So the answer is, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, when the enemy knocks, let the, let the Holy Spirit, let Jesus answer the door. He can deal with the sin. You can't. Now, every once in a while, you're going to run to the door and open it up. And you're going to mess up. You're going to feel bad. Don't worry. You got Jesus as the advocate. He intercedes for us. And then he'll say, now next time. Right? Are you with me? Okay. Let me see what else we got. So we have too many people living on the, on the wrong side of Pentecost. I'm convinced of this more than ever. Salvation for the human race is a gift to the human race. And there is not one thing I can do to earn it, to deserve it. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. And all I have to do is receive what God has given to me. Salvation. It's not by works, it's by faith. But now when I'm saved... There is also another gift that comes by birthright. See, there are certain gifts in certain families that are only given to those who have the birthright to them. You understand what I'm saying? So salvation is a free gift to anybody who will receive it. Doesn't matter if they're Jew or Greek, doesn't matter if their slaves are free, doesn't matter if they're man or woman. The salvation is free. All that is needed is a reception. But now, once we're saved, there is a gift of God that comes with a disclaimer. You must be in Christ. You must have the clean heart. You must be born again. You must have your sins washed away. Peter said it something like this, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, or because of the remission of sins, and you shall receive the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. But we've taken the Holy Spirit and we've made Him a Pentecostal message. But it's the message of the church. It's the message of Christ. The Spirit of God is the message of Jesus Christ. Do not leave Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. First Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says this, that we are kept by the power of God. But it's only through faith. So are you activating your faith by the Holy Spirit living in you? Are you walking by the Spirit of God? Because the, Spirit, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that we are only children of God if we're led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will never leave me into sin. So I have a new other way of walking. I have a new way of talking. I have a new way of being. See, Romans chapter 6 goes on to tell us that if we are baptized, we identify with Christ in His death and in His resurrection. Why is it important to baptize people, Pastor? Because it identifies them. It gives them a moment in time when they say, I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to righteousness. And when you do that, you reckon yourselves. The Bible talks about reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. Most Christians don't reckon themselves dead to sin because they say, well, you know, I'm just an old sinner. That's all I ever be. No, you're a child of God if you've received Christ. Hmm. 
And so in verse 12 it says, Now neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. In other words, don't open the door. Let Jesus open the door. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And your members, that's talking about your body parts, as instruments of righteousness unto God. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain, well let me just say this, for me, I don't sin by accident. Now, y'all may. I'm, I'm not going to put what I am on y'all. But I don't sin by accident. There's a thought that comes to my mind. And then there's either I'm going to think on it or I'm going to give it to Jesus. I'm a lot better than I used to be. I am. I'm 99% better. I've learned to walk in a power that I've never knew to walk in before. And I walk in a freedom now that I've never walked in before. But it doesn't mean that the thought doesn't come. It doesn't mean that a, a circumstance won't arise. But now... I don't meditate on the thought or the circumstance. I talk to Jesus. I pray in the Holy Spirit. I let Jesus open the door. I said, Jesus, you let them know whether I'm going to participate today or not. Uh, see, uh, let, me ask, let me ask Jesus. Uh, yeah, he said no. And then... He told me I can do all things through Him. Oh, the struggle is real, but if you get to chapter 8, there's a freedom that awaits. Because the, 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 the Spirit of Christ will set us free from the power of the flesh, the law of sin and death. Amen? Are you with me? Let me see what else I can mess y'all up with. Look at verse 14 of Romans 6. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is a power force when it comes to sin. Grace destroys sin. <laughs> what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Uh-uh. God forbid, he said. You remember in Galatians chapter 5, I'm sure you do, when it lists the works of the flesh, it says the works of the flesh are evident in these. And then it lists some, the fruit of the Spirit. And it says these things and even such like. But it makes a statement there in Galatians 5. It says that the flesh and the Spirit, they're always, they each have a strong desire to suppress the other. So if I will exercise myself unto godliness, then I will walk more free from unrighteousness. See, most Christians, well, let me not say most, that, that's a bad word. Many times we as Christians don't exercise ourselves unto godliness. And now there's a dangerous message going around that you don't have to. You don't even have to repent if you've sinned. That's a dangerous message. Now, I believe that if we sin, we ain't going to hell right away. I believe that there's a, there's a Spirit of God that's within me that will say, Hey, that's sin. And then I realize I've got an advocate with the Father and and I can pray and ask Him. And the Bible says, now, if I walk in the light as He's in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. I mean, you know that we're all bombarded. As I said, we're bombarded with sin all day long. But there are some sins that we go into wide awake. Could be all kinds of stuff. Could just be disobedience to what God's told you to do. You know, I'm not talking about adultery and all that stuff. I mean, that's included, but nobody accidentally got into bed with somebody else. Not accidentally. 
And so, and so as I'm walking in the light as he is in the light, meaning I'm, I'm, I'm in the word, I'm praying, the spirit and the word is setting me free, then it cleanses me. I mean, it, 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 it cleanses me from those, those sins that are trying to attach themselves to me. But now if I do sin, the Bible says he is faithful and just. If I repent of those sins, he's faithful and just, and he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Yes, that could be the way that I'm cleansed from all unrighteousness of that sin. Now, depending on what the sin is, there may be a consequence to it. It doesn't say he cleanses us from the consequences. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Okay? But notice in verse um, 17. But God be think that you were servants of sin. You were servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So Paul delivered a doctrine to the Roman people that will deliver them from the power of sin, that will free them from being slaves to sin. It wasn't just the, the message of salvation to be free from the penalty of sin, but to actually be free from sin. <clears throat> and part of that had to do with my baptism in water, because that's my identity. Communion, Christ in me. Baptism, me in Christ. I'm a different creature. See, we've got to get the mindset that I am a different creature. I am not the same. Because the Bible says that we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now look in verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. How about that? Would we dare tell somebody, I'm a servant of righteousness? No, but we'll tell them we're a sinner. You can say you sin. Confession is good for the soul. Confess your faults one to another and you can be healed. But that shouldn't be your only confession. That shouldn't be your only experience. You should experience freedom and sin because there's something, there's someone that dwells within you. He said, I speak after the matter of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, you, you ain't grasping this right. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanliness, to iniquity unto iniquity. He said, over and over, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Speak of God when you go to the grocery store. Worship God when you get up in the morning. Amen? Yield yourselves to God. Look at verse 22. I want you to see these things. But now, being made free from sin... We tell people all the time to get saved. Now read 1 John. How about read Romans 6? Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. But how about read Romans chapter 6? Being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And here again he says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Notice, no, it, notice it's not any other way but through Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you. If you're born again, you've made it to the cross. You've embraced the cross. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Without it, there is no hope. But Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, <clears throat> I think it was verse 49, in John chapter 20, after he breathed on them, and he says, Don't leave Jerusalem till you endued with power from on high. 
See, the, the baptism that the Spirit gives us into the body is to change our identity. The baptism that Jesus gives us in the Spirit changes our power of service. It give, he gives us a power to serve Him. We don't, we don't have power to serve Him as we should without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 5, I think it's verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine, wherein is an excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we know by that scripture that is wrong to be drunk with wine. That is in excess, right? So if it's wrong to be drunk with wine, it's just as wrong to not be filled with the Spirit of God. It's in the same sentence. If you believe it's wrong to be drunk with wine, which I believe the Bible teaches to be drunk with wine, then it's just as wrong not to be filled with the Spirit of God. So now we have to say, well, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? I'm glad you asked. We'll talk about that next week. 